Well, just last Sunday, we, uh, on Father's Day, we began a new series called More Than Conquerors, and it's based on a scripture in Romans 8 that tells us that's who we are in Christ, that we can be and live on this earth here and now as more than conquerors through him who loved us. And, and uh, we started that last Sunday, we're continuing that again today, this morning, and I want to show you that little video clip because I think it's really a, an accurate description of who our enemy is. I think it does a good job of helping us to understand in a fresh way that our enemy, the devil, he doesn't always appear to us. He does not always intersect our lives in the way that we would normally expect or maybe in the ways that we would um, look for or that's been shown to us in our culture. You know, the whole imagery of Satan with the, the red costume and the horns and the walking around with the tail and the pitchfork in his hand, that's, that's really an invention of Hollywood. And, and to tell you the truth, I think the real Satan is absolutely thrilled with that kind of stuff because if he can get our kids and get the culture wearing devil costumes and joking and laughing at devil cartoons, if he can fill the theaters with, um, um, you know, imagery of the satanic and the occult, trying to um, reach people who are seeking a thrill. Um, if he can do that, then he is very successful many times in desensitizing an entire generation, disarming an entire generation as to how serious of a threat he really is. Um, in, in the book of 2 Corinthians 11, chapter 11, verse 14, the Apostle Paul tells us that this enemy, and, and that's why I love that video so much, it says, Paul describes Satan this way. He says, Satan masquerades as an angel of light. That's pretty shocking to me, that, that, that maybe an angel of light could really be Satan. Uh, Satan masquerades as an angel of light. And, and, and you very well know probably that idea of masquerading is the idea of wearing a mask. It's the idea of putting on a disguise so uh, that your true identity um, is, is not readily known. It's not easily known by others. And the Apostle Paul tells the church, a church much like ours in, the, in a big city called Corinth, a long time ago. They were following Jesus, and yet he tells them, among you, he says, there are actually false apostles. There's deceitful workers. There's people working among you who are masquerading as, as apostles for Christ. They're not who they say they are. And then he tells them what we just read. He says, um, no wonder then, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It's not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. So, so I think sometimes Satan can look very much like, like a successful businessman, very wealthy, driving an expensive car, looking like he's living the American dream. I think Satan could look like somebody who's dressed a very... Um, who's looking very provocative, dressed in a way that we may say is seductive. I think Satan uh, lays traps for us through people like the lady that my friend Ginny Noriega, when she was here sharing her awesome story of how the Lord saved her out of such destruction and darkness, how, how she shared that story about the lady from church, lady from church who held a Bible study, a women's Bible study at her house, and Jenny, a recovering drug addict for most of her life, new found, new baby in Christ, goes to the Bible study, and after they'd had the Bible study and after everybody had left, the lady who was hosting it at her home turned to my friend Jenny and said, do you know where I, we can buy any drugs? It's true, Satan masquerades as an, as an angel of light. And, and so Satan tries to lead us to believe very often all the time, really, that he has your best interest at heart, that he he's really has concern over your well-being and over your future and, and what you want, and, and yet it's all a lie. Every single bit of it is a lie. We started out last week in the, in the, in the passage of 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 5, where Paul just comes out, or Peter, rather, comes out and says, in the Word of God, very clearly, your enemy, the devil. Did you know you have an enemy? You do, you do, whether you realize it or not, you have an enemy. It's not flesh and blood, but you have an enemy, and you can't make peace with this enemy. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ this morning, I mean, if you're a true follower of Jesus, which means you've turned from your sins, and you've turned to Christ, and you've braced him and him alone as the hope of your salvation and your eternal life. If you've done that, then the very second you did that, the very second you crossed the line of faith, you made an enemy. You made an enemy, and you have an enemy. And, and I, I don't know about you, but I live every single day of my life with the sharp awareness that I have an enemy, a spiritual enemy. Now, listen, I don't obsess over it. I don't fixate on it. But neither do I make the terrible mistake of ignoring it and just laughing it off like a lot of people do. 
Those are two equally dangerous errors. To obsess over it, to fix that. I don't do either one, but I am serious about it, and I want to be aware of it. I have an enemy. I've been married to my bride, Amy, now for 19 years. Listen, the enemy does not want us making it to 20, I promise you. The enemy wants to work in the life of my four kids, and he wants to take their tender hearts, and he wants to give them hearts of stone. He wants to make them very suspicious and skeptical and towards the things of Christ and the things of his church. He wants to work in the midst of our church. He wants to get involved in your small group and stir up suspicion there and stir up misunderstandings among close friends in Christ and brothers and sisters in Christ. I've been meeting with a lot of our church plants this week. I've been meeting with, uh, I meet every week with them in some capacity, but this week I've been talking a little more depth with some of the churches we've planted in the past and been trying to tell our leaders there who some of them are, are tired. We're, it's, it's hard work, kingdom work. I've been trying to encourage them, saying Satan doesn't want your church to exist. He doesn't want this church to exist. He doesn't want it to carry on another year. He'd love for it if the doors shut down. And if he can get involved in the relationships and he can stir up suspicions and he can stir up misunderstandings and hold grudges and bitterness, then he can bring the whole house down. We have a very real enemy. And so he masquerades as an angel of light, the Bible says, and he pretends to be something that he's not really in order that we might not discover his true identity. And he, the Bible says he's constantly roaming around looking for whom he may devour, literally destroy. And yet the good news, the good word we have this morning is that Jesus, our faithful and strong Savior, he, he says to us in this passage that we're going to study this morning, he says, you know what, I'm going to reveal his true identity to you. I'm going to call him out so you know who he is. I'm going to, I'm going to expose him and reveal who he really is because if you understand who he really is. If you are alert and understanding of what he's all about, then, then maybe you won't fall for his tricks and his tactics anymore. You know, there was a time uh, in my ministry um, where I just assumed that when I preached the word of God, everybody who was listening to me would just agree with it. I assumed that anything I preached, if it was indeed God's word, that everybody who listened to me would just automatically say, well, yeah, that's true, and, and that's right, and that's how we ought to live our lives. But, but um, unfortunately, that's no longer the case. I'm well aware of how drastically and how quickly our world is changing. And, it, and the statistics are shocking that even professing Christians no longer believe that the word of God is really the authoritative word of God. A very, very low percentage of People that sit in church every Sunday will say, mm, some parts of the Bible, we just don't know if that's really true. That's shocking to me. And so now, just because of the way our world is shifting so drastically, how much really, in all honesty, the world has influenced even those of us in the church, I no longer just, uh, just assume as a, as a blanket that everybody here is going to agree with what I'm saying. So I wouldn't be shocked. I would not be shocked at all. Because a lot of you are reaching out to unsaved and unchurched friends, and that's awesome. And if you're not a believer here this morning, if you're, if you're a skeptic of it, just know we are so glad you're here. This is a place that we welcome you and want you to continue to search and explore and ask questions and, and dig deep and find out. Because I'm telling you, um, our, the, the Word of God can stand up under it. I want you to continue to find out and ask questions. But, but I no longer assume that everybody here is going to agree with me. And so I wouldn't be shocked if there's somebody here saying, Pastor Mark, are you serious? You really believe what you just said? You believe there's a devil? A literal devil? You believe we have an enemy and he's actually masquerading many times as something else and he's you know, prowling around like a roaring lion? Do you believe that? Really? Are you serious? Well, here's what I believe. I believe Jesus, amen? I believe Jesus. Jesus talks about him in these kinds of terms. He teaches us this truth about this spiritual enemy we have who's very real. And I believe and I stake my life on every word written in the Bible. I really do. I hope you understand that. I hope you know me by now. Some of you don't. Maybe you're just new here this morning. But just know, if I didn't believe that the Bible was the authoritative, infallible, accurate word of God, I believe me, I would not be up here doing what I'm doing today. I'd be, I'd be flipping hamburgers or something. I'd be, doing, I'd be doing something else, but I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't believe that with every fiber of my being. And so let me take you to the Word of God this morning. 
And we're going to spend some time together in John chapter 8. And, and uh, John chapter 8 is an incredible, uh, the book of John is an incredible account of the life of Jesus. If you're brand new to reading the Bible, you got, you, many times we'll encourage you to start with John. It's a very, very um, wonderful way to start learning about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, which is what the Gospels are all about. And in John chapter 8, what's happening is that Jesus is having an extended conversation with a group of Jewish people, a group of very religious Jewish people at that. And, and they don't agree with Jesus, and they don't really, they're questioning some of his claims about himself. And Jesus starts this discussion out with this group of religious Jewish leaders in a very uh, pretty bold way. He's making some pretty big claims about himself, and he says there in John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. Now, now how would you feel if, if one of your friends said, I'm the light of the world? You would be like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. That's a pretty big claim. But when Jesus says it, we can trust it. And that's what he said. I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And as soon as he says that, boy, it just, it just creates quite a shock among this group of religious leaders, religious Jewish people. It, it sets off quite a buzz among them. And, and they start responding by saying, well, Jesus, how can you say that? How can you say that about yourself? I mean, come on, that's quite a claim. Just because you say it doesn't mean it's actually true. And so Jesus continues to engage them in this pretty lengthy debate about his true identity and about, the, uh, about who his heavenly father, our heavenly father is. And he actually tells them, he gets very direct with him. He says, I told you that you would die in your sin if you did not believe that I am the one I claim to be. John 8, 24. And then Jesus says to those who are arguing with it, you know, when it comes down to it, I'm not really, I'm not just speaking my own opinion. He says, you have to understand that I do nothing on my own. I only speak what the Father has taught me, for I always do what pleases him. And by the way, did you know through the Holy Spirit you have the power to do what pleases your heavenly Father? Amen, you do. Same spirit that Jesus relied on is in you. His very spirit's in you. You can please him. And he goes on to say, I'm telling you what I've seen in my Father's presence, and you do what you have heard from your Father. Now, it, it may not seem like much is going on here. Those might seem like very um, significant words. But let me tell you, this conversation is getting heated up between these Jewish leaders and, and between who Jesus, what Jesus says he is, who he says he is. And so they fire back, and they say, Abraham's our father. Because, you know, he just told him, you do what you've heard from your father. He wasn't talking about Abraham, but they said, Abraham's our father. Now, you have to understand, without getting too deep into it, for the Jewish person, Abraham was the man. I mean, he was the man. And, and man, he was the one who, um, he was the father of the Jewish nation. He was the one that had this incredible revelation from God, entered into this powerful covenant of God. He was going to be the father of the, this great nation. And he had this miraculous birth, this boy named Isaac, and all these descendants, as numerous as the stars in the sky and all this stuff. And he just had such a great, um, he was a great model to them of obedience to God's law. But the thing they didn't understand is that that obedience that Abraham modeled, it flowed out of his relationship, his close personal relationship with God and what he heard God saying to him. And, and so Jesus looks at the crowd that day and says, no, 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 Abraham's not your father. Because if Abraham was really your father, your spiritual father, then you, you would be doing what he did. But you're not doing what Abraham did. And so he says again to him, you're doing the work of your father. Now, at this point, I'm sure they're feeling like they're getting really backed into a corner, and they have nowhere to go. And so they lash out, and they kind of up the ante. And they say, well, Jesus, the only father we have is God himself. And that's when Jesus, in John 8, just absolutely levels them. Not to be mean. Not to be cruel, not to humiliate him. That's not the heart of our Savior. But he wants to expose their, their, their error in their thinking and the lie they've been believing and their, their pride. And he wants to redirect them to the truth. And so he just says it. Aren't you glad that Jesus loves us enough to tell us what we need to know? It's not what makes us feel warm and fuzzy. Amen. And he says, John 8, 44, you belong to your father, the devil. You want to carry out your father's desires. In other words, you're not acting like children of Abraham because Abram was all about listening and responding to the voice of God. But you're not hearing what God is saying to you at all because you're not willing to listen to me or believe me. You're trying to kill me because you're so blind to the fact that God sent me here. And he says to them, you're refusing to hear what God has to say. And so this, this whole discussion between Jesus and this crowd goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And here's what you need to know this morning. 
Here's the heart of this passage, okay? It's very, very simple. And it's the concern of Jesus for every single one of us here this morning, and it's simply this. Here's the question that God would have us to consider here this morning in our time together. Who are you listening to? Who are you giving ear to? What, well, right now, currently in your life, what's the loudest voice that you're listening to? And so let's go back to the words of Jesus in John chapter 8. Let's begin in verse 42. Let me just read a, a section for you, okay? Now that you know a little bit of the background that will help you. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I have come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil. And you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. I mean, folks, that's just what he does, okay? He kills. He just takes life from people whom God intends to give abundant life. That's, that's all he's about. Not holding to the truth, for there is, listen to this, no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I'm telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God, listen to these words, these are so amazing. Whoever belongs to God, hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. I remember having a conversation with a pastor quite a few years ago now. We were sitting in a room actually with a, a group of pastors and we were talking and just uh, trying to just strategize together how we could best impact our community for Christ. And I remember this one pastor in the course of this conversation says, I don't really think that we should talk about the devil at all. And uh, his reasoning was that because God is so powerful and because God is so awesome and God is so good and so loving, we really should be focused entirely on God. And we shouldn't, he said, give one minute of our time to even referencing, even talking about the devil. Well, I can kind of see what he's saying. I, I sort of kind of get his point. But here's the problem. I can't really go all the way with his reasoning. And here's why. Because the Bible... The Bible mentions and teaches on this subject so frequently. I mean, everywhere you look, it's talking about in some shape or form, by some name or another, the reality that we have an enemy. We have a spiritual adversary calls him by many, many different names. A couple, a couple hundred times in the Bible, some phrase, some form of the word will be used to reference Satan. And so it seems like God would be trying to teach us something. It wouldn't seem like God would fully endorse that kind of attitude or that kind of approach. And I confess to you, though, I don't like preaching on this subject. I can, I can think of probably 10 or 12 other subjects that I'd rather be talking on this morning. But I think it's important for us as individuals to know this. I think it's important for us as a church to have some biblical knowledge about our enemy if we're really to live as truly um, Christ-like disciples and if we're to be successful in the mission that he's given to us as a church. I'm curious, have you ever heard the phrase, um, well, speak of the devil? You ever heard that phrase? How many of you heard that? Yeah. So it's usually spoken, if you haven't heard that phrase, it's usually spoken about someone who has just walked in the room when you've just been talking about them. And they walk in at that moment, you say, well, speak of the devil. It, it, always kind of, it was always kind of interesting to me that the person walking in the room never got offended over that. You just got called the devil, and you know, we get offended over far less than that. I'm surprised that people don't get offended about being called the devil, but they just don't. It's just part of our culture. But do you know where that phrase comes from? It comes from an old saying. That's the, the, the extended saying is, well, speak of the devil, and he will appear. And so kind of the underlying thought is that, you know, you really shouldn't talk about the devil. You shouldn't mention his name. You shouldn't talk about it, because if you do, he's going to show up. And he's going to start giving you a hard time. And so the thinking is, just don't bring him up. Don't bring him up, because if you bring him up, he's going to show up. But how many of you know that's not biblical? That's not biblical. And, and would it interest you to know that the Apostle Paul had a much different approach and way of thinking about our enemy, the devil. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 11, he basically says, hey, Christians, you and I, we need to live our lives in such a way that Satan does not outwit us. And then I find what he says next so, so encouraging. He says this, for we are not unaware, we are not unaware of his schemes. I love that. I, I wonder how Paul 
became not unaware. I wonder how he became aware, rather, of the enemy. Well, it is because he studied this stuff. He, he, he sought the Lord. He, he, in other words, he, he, his attitude is, is, hey, I want to know all I can about the enemy. I mean, if you had an enemy, wouldn't you want to know his playbook? Wouldn't you want to know his battle plans that he was devising to come against you? Certainly you would. If you had that information, you could be much more successful against him. And that's Paul's attitude. He says, I want to know everything I can about him. I don't want to obsess on him. I don't want to fixate on him, but I don't want to ignore him either. I, I want to know how he attacks. I want to know about his tricks and his tactics. I, I want to have a full understanding of all the weapons that he intends to use when he attacks so that when he does come, I can be able to stand firm in the faith and I can have victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me just make sure we're clear on this this morning. The Bible never says, ignore the devil and he will flee from you. He never says, pretend the devil doesn't exist and he will leave you. No, it doesn't say that. It says in the book of James, resist the devil. Now, how are you going to do that if you don't know anything about him? Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So again, I think it's a great thing for us as a church to be spending these four weeks now uh, uh, educating ourselves about the nature of our enemy his tricks, his lies, his deceit, his schemes, so that we can stand firm in the faith and so that we can truly be more than conquerors in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so let me take you back to the words of Jesus Christ. Let's allow him to teach us and equip us this morning so we can be all he's called us to be in this world. As Jesus begins to teach about our enemy, I love how clear he is. I just love how bold and direct he is with all this. He just says it outright. He says, all right, devil, no more masquerading. No more tricks. I'm going to expose who you are. I'm going to, I'm going to shine my light on all your lies and, and all the things you're trying to do to lead my people astray. Because, he says, I don't want the father of lies lying to you anymore. I don't want him taking life from you anymore. I don't want him stealing joy and peace and hope from you anymore. I, I don't want him deceiving you and leading you astray anymore. I don't know what all goes through your mind when you hear those words of Jesus, when he speaks of the devil in that way, what thoughts you may have. One of the thoughts that instantly comes to my mind when I hear Jesus teach in this way, it's really a question. And the question is simply this, why? Knowing what we know of our enemy, knowing who he is, knowing what he's all about. I mean, he has nothing good in mind for you. He only wants to destroy you. The question is then, why? Why on earth would anybody ever, ever, ever listen to the devil? Why would you for a moment in time, even a second, give him your ear? Why would anybody ever in any situation say, you know, I think I'll just hear him out on this one. I think I'll pay attention this time. No, 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 I think this is something I probably need to listen to. Why would anybody ever do that? Because the reality is he hates you. And he only has one thing in mind for you, your destruction. He wants to put as much distance between you and God as possible. And if he can do it for all eternity, he will be absolutely thrilled with that. Again, you have to remember the heart of Jesus in this conversation back in John chapter 8. Whenever you read John chapter 8 from here on out, here's what you need to remember. The very heart of the matter for Jesus and to them and to us, is who are you giving your ear to? Who are you giving your ear to? And knowing that the teaching of Jesus wasn't just for a group of Jewish people who lived a long, long time ago, but they're still as relevant and as powerful for us today in 2018, let me just ask you, who are you listening to? And why? Why would you even for one moment ever give him even the smallest corner of influence over your life? Why would you ever allow him to get a foothold in your life and how you think or what you do or what you say? Maybe I could ask it this way. Given the title that Jesus gives to our enemy, the father of lies, maybe I could ask it this way. What lies have you been believing of the enemy lately? What lies has he been speaking into your ear? Maybe something like this. Here's one of his favorite lies. No one will ever know. You can do that. You can go there. You can take that. No, no one will ever know. I mean, come on, please. Who's going to find out? It's just this once. It's just a little. No one will ever know. And that sounds appealing, and it, it seems practical, but it doesn't, it doesn't connect with the Word of God. Here's what the Word of God says, if you want to know the truth. 
And by the way, that's the best way to combat the lies of the enemy, to know the truth. Hebrews 4.13, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of whom to, for whom do we must give an account. That's what the Bible says. That's the counter to that lie. Here's another common lie that I hear a ton these days. I'm telling you a ton. If you're on Facebook for more than two minutes, you're going to see this lie all over the place. Okay, here it is. What matters most is that you're happy. Just, I just want you to be happy. That's what I really want. Um, <laughs> but when I open up my Bible, here's what I read. I read that while we do have a God and Father in heaven who desires to bless us more than we could possibly even imagine and fill our lives with joy and good things, his greatest desire and priority number one on the Father's heart is, first of all, that you and I would live in obedience to him. That you and I would trust him enough to experience life under his lordship. <laughs> as long as you're happy. Can you, can you imagine, I was thinking about this earlier today, can you imagine using that as your parenting standard with your children? <laughs> Crazy ridiculous. Because you know what, my, I don't know about your kids, your kids are probably perfect. You know what my kids want to do sometimes? They want to chase a ball out in the middle of a busy highway. And they want to they want to shove forks in outlets. And they want to play with knives and they want to do cra and they want to eat sugar all day. That's what my kids want to do. They would be content to sit down with a 10 pound bag of sugar and eat it all. That's what they would do. If I, but I, can you imagine just saying to your kids, you know kids above all else, what we want most for you is for you to be happy. You know what that is? That's insane. That's insane. And that's a, that's, a, that's a way of sending your kids off on a path of destruction because we all know that we can't give our kids whatever they ask for, whatever makes them happy in that moment. It would destroy them. And I'm telling you, millions and millions of people all over the place are falling for that lie every single day. And, and that, that, that lie, as long as you're happy, has been used to justify and rationalize and excuse the most awful, dark, destructive behavior you can imagine. say, Pastor Mark, does, you're saying God doesn't want me to be happy? No, what I'm telling you is that Jesus Christ, your Savior, bled and died and suffered and rose again to give you more than a temporary fleeting emotional lift. What he wants is for you to have the unshakable, unquenchable joy of living in obedience to him and trusting him even when you don't understand and even when it costs you and when, even when everybody else is chattering in your ear saying, that's stupid. That's what he wants. Uh, there's a, there's a, a dozen more lies we could talk about, way too many for us to cover. You can, you can discover them in God's word. He, he uses really this, he just recycles the same lies throughout every generation, every, every, he just, the same old tire lies, he just kind of refurbishes them and sends them out again and pretty successful with that. But here, here's one, here's another one that I think is pretty, pretty successfully used by our enemy. Instead of telling you about it, I could, I could probably show you better. So, so what I did before the service um, this week is I asked, um, and she's getting very tired waiting on me here, but Lotus, could you come help me? Give Lotus a hand. She, she agreed to be brave and to come help me. Lotus, thank you. I know you were, I'm sorry to interrupt your worship over there. You were worshiping and learning about Jesus, but thanks for coming over to Big Church and helping these folks out here learn about Jesus, okay? Thank you for helping me preach. So here's what I want to do. I want to show you something. And I got something right here that I think you're going to find very exciting, Lotus. Lotus, how are you? How old are you? Let me get you a microphone. I think this will be fun. I may regret this the rest of the day, but that's all right. You know, it's, it's the last service of the day. So Lotus, tell us your name. Yeah? What's your name? How old are you? Seven and a half. Seven? Are you married? No. No, she's not married. Okay, all right, good. Hold that. Hold that microphone. Okay, I just want to make sure. Um, so I think you got something under here. Now, you got to hold it really close and talk. Are we on here? Number five? Okay. Talk, talk for a second. Say hello. Hello, hello. Check, 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 check. Check, 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 check. Nope. Nope. Okay, number five? Number five, Mike? Yep. We want to hear... Lotus as she preaches to it. Helps us preach this morning. Okay, you hold that. You hold that. Okay, so Lotus, I've got something under here that I think you're going to find very exciting, and I think you're going to be glad that you volunteered to come help this morning. Okay, so you ready for this? Check this out. Whoa. 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 Man.
maybe let's turn it this way so everybody can see. So this is a bowl, a big bowl. I got the biggest bowl I had in my house, and I brought all this candy. There are M&Ms in there and gummy bears and Skittles. And Skittles and I like six. You like, there's a lot of Skittles in there. It's all mixed together, but I think you could probably find the ones you like the best. There's uh, uh, Sour Patch stuff. There are um, jelly beans. Jelly beans are my favorite. I love those. I don't like jelly beans. You don't like jelly beans? Well, you can give that's those. That's why I taste the hot ones, so that's why I gave up. Right, not right. Yeah, it's, jelly it's a mixed beans bag, anymore. so sometimes it's, yeah. So, <laughs> so, uh, so you can give those away and bless somebody else because someone else might want them. But here's the deal. I love those stores like Mr. Bulky's. I love going in those places, the one where all the signs are saying, no, no, don't sample the candy, you know. They, they, they allow you to take as much candy as you want, but here's the deal. You've got to pay for it in those stores. And it's pretty pricey. You've got to pay for it by the pound. But guess what, Lotus? This is all free for you today. Okay. Okay, okay yeah. So, so what I'm going to do is I want you to, um, I'm going to, in just a minute, I'm going to have you just load up, and you're going to be able to take as much as you can fit in a cup. Okay, sound good? Now, hold on. Hold on the mic. We're not ready. We're going to get to the candy just a little. This is way too much temptation. Let's put this over here for just a minute. Because um, um, I've been teaching, I know you've been in children's church, but I've been preaching from John chapter 8, and I've been preaching from the words of Jesus. Sometimes I come in here. You do. I'm so glad you do. And I thank you for helping me this morning. So the words of Jesus in John chapter 8 is he's teaching us about the devil. And he, what he says about the devil in John chapter 8 is that he's a liar. Okay? That's all he does. He lies. And he's just constantly telling lies. And he's constantly trying to get people like you and I to believe stuff that's not true. And the reason he lies to us is because he wants to separate us from God. He wants to lead us away from God's very best. You know God loves you very much, right? Mm-hmm. You know that. We never tell lies to our mother or that. Good, good. And, and so Satan, but he wants you to, to uh, be tempted with things, and he wants to um, deceive you and lie to you. Um, one of his favorite lies, Lotus, is that a little bit won't hurt anything, just a little bit. So, for example, Lotus, he says to you, he may say to you, the devil, he may say, Lotus, you are a very honest and, and good girl, and you tell your parents the truth almost all the time, but it's okay if you lie just this one time. If you just tell a little lie, it'll be okay. That, that's one of his most successful lies. And he often comes to us when we're very young and starts that round of lies with us, that a little bit won't hurt. He may say to you, Lotus, you're nice to most of the kids at school and in your neighborhood. Um, it's okay if you're mean to this one kid this time. He may say, um, Lotus, you um, always obey your parents and your grandparents, but, but it's okay if you don't do what they want you to do this one time. He'll, he'll come to you like that. And, and so um, that's what he does. He's a, he's a liar, okay? So how about we get to the candy? Would you like that? Would you like some candy? Okay, so Lotus, I'm just going to let you load it up just as much as you want, okay? You, here's the scoop. Okay, here, I'll hold the mic for you. Well, there, well, we may use that candy for something else later, so maybe, can you scoop some in there? Oh, don't squander the gift, Lotus. This is a good... <laughs> She's being very dainty. Okay. All right, this crowd's only going to give me about two more minutes to preach, so you got to hurry a little bit. Okay, big, big scoops, big scoops. How much do you want? This is, a, like, this is like grace. You just take as much as you want. You may help you out? Okay, here we go. All right, all right, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, how's that? Is that enough? Do you want some more? Yes, you want a little more? Okay, we'll try to top it off here. Okay, it's pretty, it's pretty heaping up there. I don't want you to spill it, but if you do, come back and get some more. Okay, I'm going to give you all that candy. Now, here's the deal. Before you take that, i got to just do one more thing. So what I have here, you probably don't know what this is, but I, I do a lot of hunting, and some of my hunting brothers and sisters out there will understand this. What I, what I have here is Tink's 69, 100% authentic, very intense dough urine. That's what I have. So I know us hunters are crazy. We put this on ourselves, and we uh, go out into the woods. and so, so, oh, oh, my goodness. So, Lotus, take a whiff of that and tell me what you think. Wait, what's wrong? It smells like deer poop or something. Yeah, close, very close. So, Lotus, what, what, would it be all right if I just put a few drops of this in your candy? Yeah. Yeah. What? What? Lotus, no, seriously, listen to me. You're not, you're being, you got to be reasonable. I got all these good M&Ms in here and all these Skittles, and there's a lot of good candy in there. It won't hurt if I just put a few yeah. drops of, really? Well, what would this do to your candy if I put this in your candy? It would smell bad. It, it would. It would. It would mess up your candy big time, Okay. And, and you would say, you would say, if I kept trying to do that, you would say, Mark, I think you're trying to trick me. Pastor Mark, I think you're lying to me. But I would never do that. And so I'm going to put that away, and I'm going to give you this candy. And why don't you give Lotus a big hand for coming up and helping me with that, okay? You. You're welcome. So 
know, you know, it's, uh, it's cute, but uh, you get the point? Can you make application for your life? And I pray that some of what we talked about today would help you to be very, very aware as adults, because we need this too. There's not a one of us exempt from this this morning. Help you to be aware, to help you to be eyes wide open and alert about some of the areas where Satan is right now trying to influence your decisions and your priorities and your relationships. And he's trying to get you to believe a lie. And he's trying to lead you astray because of that lie. And and I understand this is a pretty sobering subject. It's pretty intense. So I want to send you out of here with some good news, and I want to encourage you. Even though the power of Satan's lies are very destructive, here's the good news of God's Word. You ready for this? Greater is he that is in you with he that is in the world. And every day of your life, that is true. If you're a believer here today, you have the very spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. And I'm telling you, if, if, the, if the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, if you have that kind of power, I'm telling you, there's nobody who can conquer you. If God be for us, who could be against us? Amen? Nothing can separate you from his love. And so you need to go here with that truth. And, and, and I just want you to understand that although we have a very real enemy, and he deceives many, I'm telling you, when you get to your Savior's presence, when you get to your eternal home in heaven, what you need to understand is that the Bible says that one day the final battle will be won. One day soon, Satan will be destroyed ultimately. And when you stand in heaven, here's one of the thoughts I'm certain will be going through your mind. Here's one of the things you'll be worshiping God for all eternity about. You will say, thank you, thank you, I'm so thankful that I did not listen to and I did not let Satan influence my life. You will say, I'm so thankful I stood firm in the faith and I resisted his lies. You will say in that moment, I'm so glad that I listened and I trusted and I obeyed even when it was hard. And you will say, I'm so thankful that I ordered my life by the word of God even when I didn't understand. That's one of the things you will say. So what I want to encourage you is, is, um, I want to to have you make a conscious effort in your heart. Make it a priority to come back in the remaining couple messages of this series. Now, now you got to listen really carefully. Here's, i got to tell you, July 1st, which is next Sunday, we're not going to be here. This building will be locked up because we're all going to go and we're going to have a community worship service in the park. Many of you know you do this every year. And we want to support that. We want to be involved with other churches. I actually have the privilege. They asked me to preach part of it. So I'm going to be sharing. I'm going to be preaching. Um, but July 1st, we're going to be in Heritage Park, okay? You can look up information. You can call the church about the times. We'll bring a lawn chair and all that. But on July 8th, the next Sunday, we're going to pick right back up where we left off here. And we're going to continue trucking with this series, More Than Conquers. And I want you to make a concerted effort. I want you to put it in your phone right now, July 8th. Top priority, worship, 8.30, 10.45, whichever service you choose to come to. And I want to encourage you to bring a friend. I want you to bring a friend that Sunday as we finish up this series because there's lots of people believing the lies of the enemy. We have cards out here. You can take these cards. In fact, I'd encourage you to come when Sundown Salute comes uh, this upcoming week. Why don't you just fill your pocket with these? Why don't you just take these and have these ready? You could, as you take in the festivities of this great celebration, you can be handing those out. Uh, circulating among the people, but then for sure, July 8th, come back. The reality is, folks, outside these doors, it's a spiritual war zone. We have an enemy waiting for you. But can I tell you the good news? I'm so thankful Jesus is on our side, amen? And I want to tell you this. You don't just fight for victory. Because of Jesus and what he did for you, you already stand in victory, amen? Amen. I pray that God will go with you. Would you stand with me? I want to pray for you. And I want to pray God's blessings on you as you go from this place. And pray that the word that was planted in your heart today will not be forgotten when you leave this building. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we love you so much. We're so thankful for a Savior that just tells us the truth. It just tells us clearly and plainly the things we need to know so that we can live for you and we can bring you glory in our lives. Lord, we don't want to, we don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit and how we live. We don't, want to, we don't want to give this world any more ammunition by falling to the prey to the enemy's lies and his tactics and his schemes, Lord. We don't want to be the people who start the race but don't finish. God, we want to finish strong. We want to finish well. And one day soon, we want to stand in your presence forever and ever and ever, worshiping you without end. 
So, Father, I pray that you'll give strength to all those who are here. I pray that you'll really, really help them think about where the enemy may be trying to influence them and, and influence their family, Lord, and speak his lies into their lives. Lord, and I pray that we will cling to you and we'll fill our mind with the truth, God. And, and Lord, we love you. And I pray, uh, praise you knowing that you'll be with us always. And when we leave here, wherever we go, you'll be with us, helping us every step of the way. I give you all the praise, Lord. Get the glory in all these families, all these homes represented here today. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. The church said, amen, amen. Have a great weekend. God bless you.